Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session on uh, El Nasari River, Spain. I would like to thank uh, Oruk and the FRCS Mentor Group for the kind invitation and the uh, amazing introduction they have made. Um, this uh, will be quite a broad topic, uh, as you may imagine, and El Nasari River, Spain is one of the challenging topics uh, in, in uh, risk assessment, as we all know. First of all, we need to uh, differentiate between uh, what type of uh, patients would come to our clinic. Uh, we have patients with ulnar side debris pain of unknown origin, and it can be repetitive strain. It's quite common nowadays because of the um, occupational requirements of uh, uh, office workers, for instance, uh, to see patients with repetitive strain injuries uh, after working long hours uh, at the desk or using a computer. Or you can have patients with subclinical um, instability uh, of the wrist, especially of the distal radioulnar joint or mid-carpal joints that can uh, be affected by ulnar side of wrist pain, and this disease is not easy to diagnose. Or uh, inflammation, psychogenic uh, causes or functional reasons, so uh, associated with specific tasks. Other types of pain are associated with identifiable origin, uh, and these are the cases of trauma, fractures, for instance, dislocation, or soft tissue damage uh, in general, TFCC disorders, more uh, the specific uh, um, portion of this wrist, ECU instability and tenosynovitis, disorders of the lunotraquitral ligament of the pisotraquitral joint, instability and arthritis of the druge, ulnocarpal abutment, vascular, neuropathic, and other disorders. So we have a real broad range of disorders. We will focus on the uh, commonest ones and the ones that are most relevant to the FRCS or uh, exam. First of all, we need to refresh a bit the anatomy of the TFCC. It's not just a cartilage, it's not just a triangular structure, it's a complex. And as a complex, it is uh, characterized by a number of structures that compose it. And you can see in this diagram that you have the central disc, but also you have a number of attachments onto the radius, radially, clearly, and onto the ulna both to the fovea of the ulna, which is the proximal most portion at the base of the ulnar styloid, and to the tip of the styloid. The main uh, and most relevant from a functional point of view attachment of the TSCC to the ulna is the foveal attachment, the one to the base uh, uh, of the styloid. Then you have, of course, the meniscus, and you have the collateral ligament, and you have uh, the dorsal and voral radio ulnar ligaments that contribute to the stability of the carpus and of the DRUJ. These uh, very nice diagrams uh, by uh, Mr. Donald Summert uh, explain it all, and you see how complex, especially on the left one, uh, is the TFCC. Uh, we need also to remember that the uh, extensor carpal ulnaris tendon subsheath is regarded as a component of the TFCC, uh, although it's partially external to it. And we have the palmar ulnocarpal ligament complex, which are the ulnotraquitral, ulnolunate, and ulnocapitate ligaments, which are also relevant uh, in case of an injury. And on the right side, you see the volar and the dorsal radioulnar ligaments. If we uh, assess the ulnar attachments, in particular of the TFCC, uh, as I previously mentioned, the uh, most relevant one from a functional uh, point of view in terms of stability is the deep attachment, also called the proximal component or PC uh, of the TFCC. The distal component, BC, uh, highlighted in yellow, um, uh, it's uh, the less relevant one. However, uh, an injury to this um, attachment still causes trouble because it causes pain, it can cause minor instability, and uh, it can not, sometimes it can be uh, not compatible uh, with the activities carried out by the uh, patient. Therefore, you need to treat it if needed. Um, remember also the iceberg concept that was uh, highlighted by um, Adze uh, about uh, and Lucchetti about the uh, shock absorber portion of the TFCC, which is the distal most portion, and the uh, proximal most, which is the stabilizing portion of the carpus and of the druge, uh, corresponding to the volar and, and dorsal radial uh, ligaments. So it's, it's a, a real complex, not just a little ligament. When you have a TFCC tear uh, and you assess a patient with this type of injury, you need to assess patients for pain and instability. 
Uh, pain can be uh, elicited uh, when you put pressure directly on the uh, fovea, which is here on the uh, ulnar side of the wrist, just distal to the ulnar head. And if you put pressure on that, you may have a positive ulnar foveal sign, which is a pain as the site of injury. However, you can test the patient in ulnar wrist deviation, also applying some pressure, uh, as it is shown in the picture, uh, and that can also elicit pain if there is a tear, even a small one. You test the forearm in pronation and supination to see whether this elicits pain, and uh, you perform the TSCC compression test, which is, again, the one shown in the picture. However, you should also um, um, deviate uh, the wrist, not just ulnar walls, but also dorsally in order to perform it. Um, uh, the best, in the best manner. Uh, instability of the druge, uh, you can assess clinically, sometimes it's subclinical, as we mentioned previously. Uh, some patients have an obvious clunking during pronation and supination, and uh, some others don't, so you need to test it. And you test the stability both in ulnar and radial deviation of the wrist. In neutral deviation of the wrist, uh, you should compare uh, always to the other side to check whether there is a congenital instability or laxity, which is not pathological, uh, and that is present in both wrists. Uh, however, if only one wrist is affected, then when you ulnarly deviate uh, the hand, you would detention further the TSCC and the instability is expected to increase. When you radially deviate the hand whilst testing the droge, uh, you should increase the stability of the TSCC if it's intact or only partially damaged. If that doesn't happen, then the damage is more significant, of course. And you can perform the piano key test. You see it on the bottom picture on the right side of the screen. You ask the patient to hold the forearm on the desk or table and press. And you see whether there is a piano key sign of the distal radial nerve joint in case of uh, more significant instability. That may be difficult to appreciate. And always remember, whichever test you're performing, you always need to compare the wrist, the injured wrist, uh, with the contralateral one. In terms of imaging, X-rays would clearly show a uh, druge dissociation, uh, as it is shown in the X-ray in the center of the screen, uh, or ulnar styloid fractures. Uh, also, ulnocarpal abutment can be seen on X-ray, especially if you see a footprint either in the lunate or in the triquitrum resulting from the abutment, or in the ulna head sometimes. However, that may be subtle, so you may want to request an MRI scan for that. Uh, in terms of dissociation, uh, when you have a clear dissociation of the, uh, of the distal radial nerve joint, especially post-traumatic, you should suspect a massive tear of the TSCC. And there is something to bear in mind and uh, not to misdiagnose or, or underestimate. MRI scans would show the occult TFCC tests, the small ones, but also the large ones for confirmation of your diagnosis, of course. And they will show better the ulnocarpal abutment. They show, like the one in the center of the screen, if there is an effusion uh, in the druge, which you also see on the picture on the right side. Uh, and uh, they also uh, can show the extent of the TFCC damage. However, if you want to have a better assessment, you should consider an arthroscopy in these cases, especially when, if you are in doubt uh, on what specific treatment you would uh, suggest to the patient. In terms of arthroscopic assessment, these are the, uh, the portals, uh, the dorsal portals to the wrist. I'm not mentioning volar portals here because they are not relevant. Um, However, the ones we commonly use are dorsal, and uh, the ones on the uh, right side of the screen also include the DRUJ portal and the foveal portal to see the foveal attachment of the TFCC, which are the proximal most ones on the screen. Uh, these portals are quite advanced portals, they're very difficult uh, uh, to gain access to, and uh, you may cause damage yourself when you gain access to them if you don't know exactly where to put the instruments. Therefore, I would recommend to use them only once you master the, your arthroscopic skills um, uh, appropriately. So uh, the main portals we use are the 3-4, uh, which is the initial portal usually for uh, camera insertion in the radiocarpal joint, and the 6-R and 6-U for insertion of the, uh, of the instruments. The mid-carpal, radial, and ulnar portals located about one centimeter distal to the proximal ones are also useful for the mid-carpal joint assessment, especially if you want to assess the capitate head and the scaphalunate and lunotraquitral instability through the scaphalunate and lunotraquitral intervals. Uh, 
in case of a, a detachment of the distal component, which means the least relevant, however still important, component of the TFCC uh, on the ulna uh, styloid, uh, with the camera in the portal 3-4 and the hook in 6-R, you can perform uh, the hook test. You can try and basically push the uh, TFCC towards you. If you see the TFCC lifted up as a wave in the sea, as you see on the right side of the screen, that's a positive hook test, and it means that there is a detached uh, attachment of the FCC. But this would mean that the detachment is actually massive. Therefore, you need to consider, if you have a positive hook test, that there could be most likely an injury also to the proximal component of the uh, TFCC, not just to the distal. In this case, mastering the technique of uh, visualizing the proximal component through the foveal portal uh, would come useful. However, this test already gives you a lot of information. It is not just a distal tear, it is also a proximal tear. If, like on the picture on the left side, you only see a detached TFCC uh, from the uh, ulnar aspect of the, of the wrist, and the uh, hook test does not lift uh, the TFCC uh, as a wave uh, in the sea, as I said, uh, that's a negative hook test, and that's definitely just a distal uh, tear of the TFCC which you can address otherwise. You will see later that you can either debride them or attach them as required. Another important test is the trampoline test. Uh, you need to just apply a gentle pressure with the hook to the TFCC and see whether it bounces back. Uh, it's quite confusing to call it positive or negative because um, what does it really mean? The trampoline test should elicit the bouncing of the TFCC. If it doesn't bounce back and uh, uh, doesn't bounce back and it's uh, detentioned, uh, that means that there is a, a detached uh, part of the TFCC, so it has lost tension. However, if you elicit the trampoline test uh, and uh, it's therefore uh, a, pre a trampoline test that is present, uh, it means that the TFCC is healthy. So it's very difficult to define it as positive or negative. I would say whether it's present or not present. In terms of proximal TFCC uh, visualization, as explained earlier on, you can put the camera in the druge and you can also use your uh, uh, probe or, uh, or uh, shaver uh, ulnarly. However, that is quite, quite difficult and intricate to do. Remember the pulmonary classifications. It is very important for your uh, FRCS off exam. Uh, it's uh, the university, rec university recognized classification of TFCC tears. You have type one, which are the traumatic tears, and type two, the degenerative tears. And depending on which type you are, uh, you are seeing, then there are specific treatments. Uh, the commonest traumatic tears is class one B. Therefore, this has led to a lot of uh, literature being um, created on this topic, especially in terms of treatment. And uh, uh, an important uh, treatment-oriented classification you should uh, remember is the one uh, by Atsei, uh, the US, the European Wrist Arthroscopy Society uh, one, which classifies uh, the tears, uh, uh, the 1B tears, based also on um, the, not only on their characteristics, but also on the uh, repairability or not of the tears. Um, this is a paper that I would recommend uh, to read because it's a review uh, of this classification with a treatment algorithm uh, based on, uh, on the severity and of the repairability of the tears. So it could be useful for your exam. This is also, <coughs> excuse me, from the same paper. It, it explains, uh, as you can see, it looks quite intricate, however, it's quite simple. It's really based on, uh, on what you see, uh, how old is the injury, how repairable it is, and then you decide what treatment uh, um, is more appropriate. You can repair tears uh, arthroscopically or, uh, or uh, by means of an open technique. Arthroscopically, you can insert uh, your sutures through a needle. Um, PDS is one of the common sutures that are used. However, you can use other, other materials, of course, depending on your practice. And then you can pull the suture out using a double loop or a mosquito or a retriever and, and uh, uh, knot it uh, around the wrist capsule. Remember, uh, uh, if you are asked about these techniques, it's extremely important to protect the dorsal branches of the ulnar nerve and the ECU tendon uh, when you perform it. So you need to make a, a mini approach. Although it's arthroscopic, you have to open a bit the skin to visualize the structures uh, lying on the capsule because you don't want to entrap uh, the ulnar nerve branches or um, 
the ECU in your suture when you tie the knot. There are also um, all in techniques to repair tears that you can perform uh, arthroscopically. <clears throat> <clears throat> when you have a wrist fracture like this with the TFCC avulsion, uh, that's uh, something you need to consider, that it also causes an avulsion of the ulnar styloid, because when you have a high energy fracture, the displacement of the radius dorsally pulls the TFCC so strongly and acutely that it usually doesn't tend to come off the bone, but it tends to cause a bony avulsion. As you can see here, it's a high energy injury with a severe comminution, um, intra-articular involvement that required a double plating uh, to stabilize due to its uh, uh, extreme instability. And in this case, the ulnar styloid was reattached. However, um, when do you reattach the ulnar styloid? This is an important uh, um, consideration and also an important question you may be asked. You reattach it when uh, the avulsion of the styloid causes a complete TFCC avulsion with um, subsequent DRUJ instability, which means you first should um, fix the radius <clears throat> and give stability to the wrist. Once the radius is fixed, you should assess the droge for instability intraoperatively. And then you make your mind up. And this is based on a number of criteria, not just on the instability, also on the patient general conditions, on the functional requirements, on uh, uh, prognostic factors, of course, and uh, uh, you need to make uh, uh, your uh, decisions there. Therefore, it's always worth discussing this, um, the option of reattaching the styroid or not with the patient uh, prior to performing um, open reduction in internal fixation surgery on the wrist in these cases. Uh, and you can uh, uh, make a plan with the patient accordingly, of course, explaining uh, uh, according to the principles of the informed consent. Uh, in this case, uh, the decision was made to uh, fix the styloid because there was gross instability of the deprouge uh, after fixation of the ray. Um, as I was mentioning, when you have a, an avulsed uh, ulnar styloid, like in this case, you need to consider the anatomy of the styloid. Uh, as you can see in the central X-ray, uh, also the fovea uh, was avulsed in this case, and that caused the detachment of the proximal component of the TFCC. In order to reattach the proximal component when it's avulsed without an ulnar styloid bony avulsion, uh, you can do it either by using uh, an, an anchor, like this is shown on the bottom part of this uh, slide, or you can create uh, intraosseous tunnels with K wires and sutures that will allow you to reattach the proximal component back onto the fovea. Remember, immobilization postoperatively uh, of the forearm uh, to avoid pronation and supination is important. Uh, however, whenever it is possible to, you should uh, start uh, rehabilitation uh, of the elbow in fashion and extension and of the wrist in fashion and extension. Therefore, sugar tongue splints uh, are very useful for these patients postoperatively. Remember also the degenerative tears and the central perforation of the TFCC. They, uh, these ones, uh, they are either non-repairable or do not require repair because don't cause instability unless uh, they affect the peripheral portions of the FCC. Therefore, you would consider a debridement in these ones. When you have a repair, a repair, irreparable tears uh, that cause a gross instability of the druge, you may want to consider a stabilization. To stabilize it when the bruise is, when the TFC is no longer repairable, you need to use a tendon graft. There is a beautiful technique that uh, was described by uh, Brian Adams with Berger. And uh, uh, this technique uses a palmaris longus tendon graft, uh, tunnelized into the distal radius. Um, per, um, transversely and uh, uh, obliquely into the fovea of the ulna. And you can see here that then the tendon, as it comes out on the metaphysis of the ulna, can then be fixed back to itself or the ulna. Uh, bear in mind, uh, when we describe this technique, that um, the palmaris longus tendon is uh, not always very long, and uh, it may not be possible to loop it back onto itself at the uh, metaphysis of the ulna. Therefore, you would have to fix it by other means. And uh, um, you can use bone anchors or you can use uh, interference screws. As you can see here, uh, you have a, um, on the left, uh, well visible on X-ray, uh, a distal radial joint um, dissociation. Uh, 
also shown on the MRI scan, and there was an irreparable tear, both uh, of the ulnar and of the radial components of the TFCC. So it was a bifocal tear in this case. And uh, Adam's technique with palmaris longus tendon graft and fixation to the ulna with uh, bone anchors allowed to restore Drew stability. Postoperatively, you need to remember uh, what I mentioned earlier on, it's paramount to protect uh, the TFCC, either whether you have uh, repaired it or reconstructed it. So an above elbow a plaster slab with neutral forearm rotation and, or mild supination uh, can be applied for two weeks. However, remember to use sugar tongue splints because they allow the patient to flex uh, and extend the elbow in order to avoid elbow stiffness without pronating and supinating the forearm. Uh, you can also ask uh, uh, the um, therapists and the patient to consider some wrist uh, flexion and extension out of the splint. However, uh, you need to be absolutely sure that uh, the patient would not pronate and supinate the forearm. So this will be tricky. It really depends uh, on the case, uh, on the compliance, and uh, on the fact uh, on whether the patient is regularly followed up uh, by the hand therapist or not. And then you have, of course, the option of uh, post-operative rehabilitation with below elbow splinting and return to activities later on. This takes some, quite some time to recover. <clears throat> when you have Drew's arthritis, which is another potential uh, um, cause of um, ulnar side debris pain, then you have a lot of options. You have non-operative options um, like splinting, occupational therapy with activity modification and posture adaptations, and you can consider injection of steroids in the Drew's. There are also surgical options. There is a full range of options. Um, one of them, probably the old fashioned one, was the Sauvé Capangi option, which you can also use uh, for other indications. Uh, <clears throat> it can still be used in certain cases. However, you need to bear in mind that the owner um, stump would become quite unstable and you may face uh, instability uh, and associated pain problems. So this is something to bear in mind. <clears throat> However, if you have a, a stable um, ligamentous structures, you can consider an, an ulnar head replacement. There are also partial ulnar head replacements available. Or if you have a very severe uh, arthritis with very severe instability of the droge as well, uh, so no ligamentous stability that uh, therefore does not allow you to use a normal ulnar head replacement, you can consider the total droge replacement. There is this implant uh, on the right uh, bottom uh, part of your screen that uh, was developed a few years ago and uh, it has this specific indication. Another cause for ulnar side of this pain, uh, we move on with the soft tissues now, is the um, ECU tenosynovitis. It's quite common. You will come across it. It's not always associated with uh, instability. It may be caused by overuse uh, of the wrist. And you need to remember that uh, also this one can be treated either non-operatively or surgically. Uh, you may see some swelling over the ECU, but sometimes the swelling is very mild, so it, uh, it may not be present. However, you would definitely have tenderness on palpation over the tendon, especially over the ulnar head and the distal portion uh, of the tendon. And uh, you can uh, refer the patient for splinting or occupational therapy, again, with activity modification or adaptations and injection of steroids. And you can consider also surgical options if the non-operative treatment fails. Tenosynovectomy as you would do for any other uh, tenosynovitis if it doesn't uh, subside following non-operative management, or ECU stabilization if you have some instability. Let's talk about instability. Instability can be severe and lead to subluxation of the tendon, as you can see here. Remember that the patients with a shallow uh, uh, groove of the, uh, on the hull head for the ECU uh, are more susceptible to develop this type of uh, disorder. However, it can occur to anyone after even lifting uh, um, uh, an heavy object and pronating or, uh, or supinating forcibly the forearm. And uh, this can lead to a, a disruption uh, of the um, osteofibrous tunnel uh, that uh, holds the ECU in place in its groove. And this may lead to uh, subluxation that becomes painful. Uh, patients complain of a painful uh, 
clicking of the wrist during pronation and supination. But sometimes this can be quite subtle. So you may want to investigate it further with ultrasound scan if you are not sure based on clinical assessment in pronation and supination alone. Again, you have non-operative and surgical options. Uh, non-operatively, you can use an available cast uh, uh, and the sugar tongue splint. Uh, but again, it should be an acute uh, injury to the sheath of the ECU for this to work. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Uh, chronically, uh, just for symptom relief purposes, you can consider again splinting, even with the wrist extended, to detention the ECU, occupational therapy, and steroid injections. However, if you want to treat a chronic subluxation that causes chronic pain to the patient, uh, you need to consider surgical options. And this use stabilization can be performed um, by means of a reconstruction of the tunnel. You can use a, a flap of um, extensor retinaculum to reconstruct it. Or if you are in an acute setting and you um, are treating acutely uh, an injury that occurred recently, you can just repair the tunnel as required. Isotracheal disorders. So we move to the other side uh, of the wrist, the volar side. Uh, however, we remain on the ulnar uh, aspect of the wrist. These are also common. Uh, clearly, uh, arthritis has the lion's share uh, because uh, isotracheal arthritis is quite common because of aging process, because of uh, uh, the way the, the hand is used, or specific occupational uh, or reasons or hobbies. And uh, it's quite painful because every time uh, the patient applies pressure uh, to the piezotraquitral region, uh, the pain is, is elicited. And it's quite a, um, it's quite a, a difficult uh, pain to cope with because there are a number of activities that we do when we require power grip or to uh, apply pressure to the um, volar ulnar aspect of our wrist. Therefore, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite a problem and uh, definitely requires uh, to be identified and treated. In terms of uh, investigations, uh, you, uh, you would request uh, X-rays in uh, 30 degrees of supination in order to, uh, to be able to visualize the piezotraquitral joint. Uh, and in terms of MRI scan, of course, as you can see here, uh, that becomes even clearer if you have arthritis or piezotraquitral ganglia or effusion because they become very obvious on the MRI scan. Remember that they can also cause compression to the neighboring structures like the ulnar nerve, as we will see later on in the presentation. <clears throat> Pisotraquitral joint arthritis, the diagnosis is clinical really, uh, based on the presence of pain on palpation and direct pressure on the area. There can be swelling, but swelling can be subtle as well, depending on the size of the hand as well, uh, and of the subcutaneous tissues uh, of the patient you are assessing. Um, X-rays will require the piezotraquitral view, which is the lateral view with 30 degrees of supination. And you can request, as I explained earlier on, an MRI scan that shows it all, including the presence of effusion or ganglia. Treatment can be conservative or surgical. Conservative uh, is a splinting or application of a soft padding to, to the area uh, that the patient can use uh, whenever they work or perform their hobbies that would cause pain otherwise, or steroid injections into the piezotraquitral joint. I would recommend to do them either X-ray guided or ultrasound guided because it's quite difficult to have access to this tiny joint, especially when the space is very narrow. Surgically speaking, uh, you can uh, is, propose uh, either a pisiformectomy, so excision of the pisiform, or piezotraquitral fusion. The indication for, uh, for fusion usually is in uh, um, uh, in patients who are uh, uh, manual laborers or uh, very sporty, uh, definitely the younger patients, because uh, by means of not removing the, the, the pisiform, you uh, preserve somehow, to some extent really, the strength of the FCU. Uh, removal of the uh, pisiform is not a big problem in terms of um, ECU strength reduction. However, it has been demonstrated that there is some strength reduction. Therefore, you wouldn't want uh, to consider probably a pisiformectomy in a younger patient with high functional demand and uh, uh, performing sports. 
Lunar triquitral instability is another potential um, cause of ulnar side of wrist pain. Uh, sometimes it, a lunar triquitral ligament disruption is associated with an TFCC uh, tear, especially if post-traumatic. Therefore, uh, arthroscopy once again becomes quite important because you will be able to see whether there is a step off in the lunar triquitral joint uh, not seen on X-ray or uh, whether there is uh, uh, the presence of a gross instability that allows uh, you to insert your hook uh, in the lunotraquitral interval and see whether this uh, dissociates. Remember also that um, in the later stages uh, of lunotraquitral dissociation, you may also see the, the so-called VZ deformity, uh, which is uh, uh, the opposite of the DZ. So you see the lunate uh, tilted, um, palmar walls instead of dorsally. This is something we all see in clinic uh, every so often, is a, is a congenital um, difference. It's called lunotraquitral coalition. There is a classification for it. There are three types. Uh, you can have a, a so-called champagne flute uh, uh, pattern, which is the top one on the right side. Uh, and uh, um, you see a partial coalition is a synchondrosis, mostly in that case. But it can cause pain because of the stiffness uh, of the lunotraquitral interface. Uh, in type 2, you see a partial coalition, partial bony fusion. Type 3, you see the total bony fusion. I'm mentioning this because <clears throat> this is, again, congenital, as I mentioned. Uh, and uh, uh, over time, it causes arthritic changes. Uh, we see patients um, in, uh, in the, uh, the 50s, usually, or 60s, coming to our clinics with this kind of uh, disorder. This is quite severe in this specific case I've chosen for this presentation. However, you can see milder types of um, arthritis and abutment in the area. This is clearly uh, a, a ulnar um, uh, sided uh, abutment in the wrist that causes ulnar sided pain, sometimes a bit more central sided because the lunate is affected. However, it can be a cause of ulnar sided wrist pain. Treatment is quite difficult here because you don't have a lunotraquitral interval. Uh, so you need to consider uh, initially non-operative management, <coughs> including splinting and uh, uh, steroid injections. But if you then have to consider surgical treatment, uh, it becomes more, more intricate. And uh, also because the lunate fossa uh, of the radius, uh, like in this case, appears damaged. So you need to consider carefully your options because these patients usually have quite a good range of motion. So any bony surgery needs to be carefully discussed with the patient, um, discussing the balance of uh, pros and cons very, very carefully. These ones are more subtle types. Type 1, for instance, as I showed you earlier on today, you may not be able to identify it initially the first times you see it, but over time with practice, and as you see more of these um, coalitions, you will get used to it. And you can see the champagne flute um, configuration. Endocarpal abutment is also uh, fairly common in patients with positive ulnar variance, which means a longer ulnar than the radius. Uh, it's one of the normal uh, variations of the ulnar length, so it's not a pathological uh, finding per se. However, it causes ulnocarpal pain because of the abutment either on the lunate or on the triquitum. Uh, and if that happens, of course, the TSCC becomes uh, chronically damaged and uh, the patient would come and seek uh, your expert advice for pain. In these cases, you need to consider, um, again, non-operative options like splinting, injection of steroids and occupational therapy. But should they fail, you need to consider surgery. And surgery, you have two options here. You have either the wafer procedure, which is a partial resection of the distal ulna head. You just remove a little uh, portion of the distal ulna, only a couple of millimeters, really. You can't remove more than that, otherwise you end up performing a Darvax procedure, which is what you don't want to perform, which is an ulnar head resection that may cause then instability of the ulnar stump. And it's a completely different procedure that you use in other cases, rheumatoid or... Uh, other cases and also very rarely. So uh, you need to remove really only a couple of millimeters. And uh, um, you can do it arthroscopically using a, a bone burr. Uh, and as you can see in that arthroscopic picture, you see the helma head underneath the uh, broadly uh, damaged TFCC central disc. Uh, 
And when you perform it arthroscopically, it's very time consuming. And remember, you need to continue to pronate and supinate the forearm as you shave the other head, because the other head is broader than you would expect. And by means of continued continue, uh, pronation and supination during um, the procedure, you would be able to create a flat surface on the distal uh, edge of the other head. It is a bit simpler and safer uh, to perform the procedure um, open, as I will show you uh, with the next slides. So this one is a case that was treated arthroscopically, and you can see the ulna head has been brought down to the same length of the radius, thus uh, reducing the uh, abutment uh, on, the, on the lunate. Post-operative care, it's uh, application of a plaster slab followed by a splint and hand therapy. This procedure does not change the stability, so it doesn't really affect it. Uh, this is another case where it could uh, be useful to consider this type of procedure because it's, uh, it's, a, it's an unfortunate uh, uh, malunion of the radius in this case. It's not an ulnar disorder. And uh, uh, this malunion occurred in childhood, therefore it led to a length uh, discrepancy which is significant. In this case, you may be tempted to perform an ulnar shortening osteotomy. Um, so uh, I will show you later how it works. However, um, reducing the length of the ulna at the um, diaphysial level with a plate and screw insertion. However, uh, as you can see on the left, uh, the sigmoid notch of the radius is also anomalous. So reducing drastically the length of the ulna in this case would cause more trouble than be helpful, because it would create a, an interface between the ulna head and the sigmoid notch that has, ever, has never had the ulna head and that has an anomalous shape. Uh, so uh, in this case, because of the injury, the fact of the injury occurred in childhood, um, there was no indication to an ulna shot into osteotomy, and you can perform a wafer procedure. And interestingly enough, an arthroscopic assessment shows the dorsum as a traquitrum as a bare bone because of the ulnocarpal severe abutment. And this is the open procedure performed uh, that you can uh, do uh, more easily through an approach through the fifth compartment. The tendon that you see uh, pulled away is uh, the EDM tendon. Postoperatively, after you have uh, um, reduced the abutment, you can again apply a splint and then consider hand therapy. Madeline deformity. This is also another cause of wrist pain on the ulnar side. Um, usually, the onset is uh, um, during the late childhood and teenage years uh, because of the increased functional uh, requirements. And uh, uh, in these cases, the ulna is definitely very long and, and the buttoning of the carpus dorsally. The carpus is also palmarly and proximally subluxed, so it's not just an, ul an ulnocarpal abutment in these cases. Uh, in order to achieve um, the extent of shortening uh, you would like to achieve in these cases, you need to consider a formal osteotomy, not just a wafer procedure. So you need to shorten the ulna as much as you can. Uh, depending on the system you use for the ulna shortening osteotomy, you may be able to shorten uh, even up to eight millimeters or sometimes to one centimeter. So it's quite a significant shortening you can achieve uh, by, um, by these means. Remember that there is also the option of correcting the radius by means of a corrective osteotomy that increases, uh, no, improves not only the tilt uh, of the radius in both planes, but also the length because of the uh, improvement of the tilt to some extent. Uh, and you can do uh, either of these procedures or decide to perform them uh, in, a, in a, a sequence. And this is a case treated with uh, the ulnar shortening uh, osteotomy, as I mentioned. Malunion of the distal radius is another, is another problem. Um, when the malunion is significant, so you have a significant dorsal tilt of the radius, then you would consider uh, correcting the malunion first. However, uh, in cases where the malunion did not lead to a very severe uh, um, dorsal angulation uh, of the radius, or in cases like this one, in which uh, addressing the malunion of the distal radius very distally wouldn't change things much because the malunion is quite proximal, uh, as you can see, uh, then you can consider an ulnar shortening osteotomy as an option. And this was done in this case, uh, leading to uh, uh, resolution of the pain. <laughs> 
remember that we're not only here to discuss about bony disorders of, of, or tendinous disorders, but we're talking about ulnar side of wrist pain. Another potential cause, which is not that common, however, not even that uncommon, is the hypothenar hammer syndrome. Remember, uh, this is usually associated with uh, uh, manual activities uh, of the patient, especially repetitive uh, um, trauma to the, or micro trauma to the ulnar aspect of the wrist and palm of the hand, and is a true ulnar artery aneurysm that you should treat as such. It can be resected and the ulnar artery ends can be either joined together or in case they don't reach, which is not common, however, you can uh, uh, use the vein, a vein graft to reconstruct them. So there is something you should also mention as a potential cause of ulnar side of risk pain, as well as nerve injuries. You can have injuries to the ulnar nerve uh, on the ulnar side of the hand caused by compression caused by tumors or caused by trauma uh, that would uh, uh, lead to symptoms on the ulnar side of the wrist. The anatomy of the ulnar nerve is paramount, especially uh, in terms of Guillaume's canal anatomy, you need to know that there are three zones. In zone one, you have both the motor, which is the proximal most, you've got both the motor and the sensory components of the nerve. In zone two, the motor ones, and in zone three, uh, the sensory, this to the bifurcation. Uh, remember that uh, anything arising from the pisotraquitral joint, like a ganglion, for instance, can compress the ulnar nerve uh, in the one. And remember that a fracture of the hamate, especially a fracture of the base of the hook of the hamate, can cause a compression of the ulnar nerve in zone two, or even zone three, if, if it is badly displaced and there is a um, local um, uh, effusion and, uh, and bleeding as well. So you need to remember also these, you need to remember the, the anatomy uh, of the ulnar nerve and the symptoms that make different the Guillaume's canal compression uh, from uh, an higher uh, compression of the ulnar nerve. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you um, very much, uh, Mr. Gang <laughs> Gagnani. Um, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, yeah, I certainly learned a lot. It's one of those things that I think we sometimes forget when we're treating just the radius fractures and they have ongoing pain, we sometimes forget to think about distal radial joint arthritis or um, TFCC injuries. So it's really useful. I'm sure the candidates will um, appreciate it. I got distal radial ulnar joint arthritis in one of my short cases in my exams as well. And I think I also got a mad lung, so very important. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna ask Joe um, to unmute himself and ask some questions that the candidates have been putting in the chat box, if that's okay. Off Hello, you go, Mr. Gagliani. Uh, hi, thank oh. you, Nikki. Hello, Mr. Gagliani, very, very nice talk uh, and very important, actually, and especially in the short cases. Uh, so the first, uh, actually, it's a very popular topic. Um, so the first question was, uh, is it the MRI or an MR arthrogram uh, better to look at the TFCC? Yeah, uh, this is actually a very good question because the MR arthrogram is something I was also trained at when I did my training in hand and wrist. And, uh, but it's actually something we don't use that much because uh, nowadays uh, the arthrogram can, can show perforations of the TFCC that are not really significant from a... a, a pathological point of view. We, we may have a TFCC perforation at birth and we are not aware of it. So uh, the arthrogram has lost a bit uh, uh, grounds compared with traditional MRI scans, which would be perfectly reasonable to do nowadays for a TFCC, bearing in mind that nowadays we can also do an arthroscopy. So whenever we are in doubt, we can actually assess it better by means of direct visualization. So I would say MRI and arthroscopy is now the gold standard. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, ideal implant for fixation of the ulnar styloids? Uh, there, are, uh, there are implants. Um, in the case I showed you, um, a screw was used. However, you can use uh, K-wires for fixing it. You can use a figure of eight uh, uh, suture as well as even linked to a K-wire or two K-wires. Uh, so it's a tension band construct. You can even use tension band wiring uh, if you have very fine um, tension band wire available. Uh, or um, there are also, when you have fractures of the head of the ulna, in 
including the styloid, there are also little plates available that allow you to hook the ulnar styloid down back yeah. onto its, its base. Yeah. And for the Gilyazi fracture, of course, with disruption of the sterility ulnar joint, how many K wires do you use? Do you use one or two? We tend to use two K wires in those cases two to K give uh, better stability, yes. And to leave it for how long? Uh, usually six weeks for the soft tissue healing. Yeah. But clearly, you need to bear in mind that they are very difficult, uh, this, this case, those cases, because uh, K-wiring of this area joint leads to significant stiffness and also may uh, uh, cause uh, other um, periosteal reactions that can cause pain as well. So you need to be a bit careful. And do you bury them or leave them around? Bur- Personally, I tend uh, to bury all K-wires in the wrist. Uh, because I'm well aware of the risk of uh, septic arthritis and osteomyelitis, which is a disaster in the wrist. Good. And uh, is there any preference or selection for the patient uh, to uh, decide Darex as uh, versus to Suvi Kabanji or fusion or arthroplasty? Darex, I would tend to use only in extremely selected cases. I'm talking about uh, elderly patients with very low functional demand and extreme changes of the wrist, talking about rheumatoid cases. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, a Darex could, could do uh, the job, of course, of, uh, of improving the symptoms. However, yeah. it's not my first choice ever, and I don't think that uh, is anyone's first choice nowadays. So the Kabanji yeah. has also very limited indications, and this again something that is more historical nowadays rather than currently used much. Uh, so uh, we tend to use more uh, replacement surgery when required. However, uh, it's not always required because there are also non-operative treatments available. Yeah, thank you. And um, is there any specific test to do on table under GA to uh, test the stability of the distal radial joint? Yeah, it's very important to test it. It's just the same way you would test in clinic, really. Yeah. Uh, so you need to test it with the wrist in this position in ulnar deviation to test if there is some instability which should be present in ulnar deviation, neutral and radial deviation. In radial deviation, you should tighten up. So the TFCC should be able to, to uh, increase testing it uh, is to test uh, by, by means of moving the radius instead of moving the ulna. Because actually, if you think about it, the ulna doesn't move in dorsal yeah. and, and the dorsal and, and palmar plane. It is the radius that does it. So you could hold the ulna stable and move the radius. It doesn't really matter as, you, as long as you test the stability of the joint. Yeah, thank you. And uh, there is a question from a physi- physiotherapy point of view. Uh, uh, view. Uh, why do you prohibit supination pronation after reconstruction and uh, for how long? Yeah, uh, yeah that's a, good, a very good question because it really depends on what type of reconstruction is done. I would say if it's a minor peripheral tear that you have this like a distal component of the TSC tear that you repaired, uh, you uh, can actually safely start mobilizing sooner rather than later. So in that case, I wouldn't immobilize pronation and supination for six weeks. I would do it for a limited period of time, just two weeks probably. Yeah. Uh, and then I would start with gentle uh, exercise. But that really depends on the stability that you have achieved. Uh, if uh, you perform a reconstruction of the TSCC, then I would wait a bit longer because uh, although the risk becomes stiff, it's yeah. actually the aim of the procedure to create some stiffness. Uh, we will overcome the stiffness with rehabilitation later on. Uh, so uh, it depends really on the severity of the injury and on the repair you make. So if it's a stable repair with a small injury, you can move sooner uh, in pronation and supination. If it's an unstable, uh, very unstable um, TFCC, uh, badly torn, and uh, the repair is significant or a reconstruction has been performed, then you w- I would be a bit more careful. However, the sugar tongue splints allows you to mobilize the elbow. Uh, and also you can ask the patient, as I said, to flex and extend without pronation and supinating yeah. uh, after four weeks. So they start uh, uh, mobilizing the wrist. Thank you. And in type 3 leonotriquitral coalition with cystic change in the leonate, proximal row carpectomy, is it an option? I would actually like to ask this question to everyone <laughs> yeah. in the audience because uh, uh, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> because this is actually a good question for uh, uh, for the exam. It's uh, uh, 
it's not it's not an option if you have um, uh, lunate fossa changes. So yeah. whenever you have lunate fossa changes, uh, unfortunately, you lose a lot of options because you lose the option of performing a proximal rotor back. Uh, uh, you lose an option of a four corner fusion too because there's no <laughs> there's no way it would work. You would keep the arthritis there. You just make uh, more stiffness. So in that case, then you need to consider um, more significant procedures. Talking about arthroplasty or total joint fusion or a more benign one, which is a denervation of the wrist. Uh, denervation could allow you, uh, unfortunately not in all cases, but often it works, to uh, reduce the symptoms or uh, significantly improve them, and by time. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, well, this is more or less three questions in one. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> how much ulnar variance uh, can be corrected by wafer? Mm -hmm and uh, how much ulnar variance needed to be treated and can we do a radial lengthening in, uh, instead? So, uh, first question, a wafer doesn't correct more than two, maximum three millimeters. I wouldn't do more than that, otherwise, as I mentioned, it becomes a darrex. Uh, the ulnar head is not very long, so you end up redu uh, removing a lot of ulnar head uh, if you do more than that. If you need to shorten by uh, more than two or three millimeters, I would recommend that you perform an ulnar shortening osteotomy, uh, which you can perform from anything between five to eight uh, millimeters or even one centimeter with some systems. It depends on the system, on the plate uh, uh, that you choose, really, because each company makes it slightly different. Uh, in terms of uh, um, when you need to do it, you need to do it only if the patient is symptomatic. So if the ulnar carpal abutment is present but not symptomatic, there's clearly no indication. We treat pain, we don't treat the x-ray. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, if there is there are symptoms and uh, they are unfortunately uh, present despite non-operative treatment, then you consider a shortening and you discuss the extent of shortening based on the length of the ulna. An important point um, I didn't make during the presentation but I will make now is how to request the x-rays assess the other length. You need to ask the radiographer to put the arm in this position with 90 degrees of shoulder abduction and 90 degrees elbow flexion. It's the mm -hmm. only way for the post posterior anterior uh, x-ray view. It's the only way uh, to see the actual length of the ulna in relation to the radius. And then you can measure the extent of ulnar positive variance. But again, you only operate if the patient is symptomatic. Don't operate on an asymptomatic one. Last question was um, about... Um, Can you do radial lengthening? Radial lengthening. Radial lengthening, I would not really recommend because uh, it's a very uh, intricate procedure. Uh, it requires bone grafting, most likely, uh, and uh, it's an extensive approach and uh, it's not uh, as benign as a wafer or as an ulnar shortening. So it is possible. Uh, however, we only use radial lengthening when we have a significant discrepancy, uh, when we uh, would not be able to achieve uh, a, a, an appropriate uh, shortening, uh, uh, sorry, decompression uh, of the ulnocarpal region with ulnar shortening alone. So we can do a radial lengthening, and if it's not sufficient, you also do ulnar shortening on those cases. But usually, we are talking about distal radius malunion in this case. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, that's great. Thank you, Joe. Um, sure. So, what we'll do now is um, if Ruth is available, we will share the MCQ questions. Um, and if you can all answer them as soon as you can, as I, as I said before, it's all anonymous. We don't know what answer you've put, but the sooner we do the MCQs, then we can move on to the vivas. Thank you. I'm afraid that's not correct. Um, it is not the commonest cause of ulnar side of wrist pain. It is one of the potential causes. It can definitely be treated by means of osteofibrous sheath reconstruction, which is, I see, what uh, most people have uh, correctly uh, um, confirmed, uh, especially when it's uh, uh, either um, acute, you can do a repair, or chronic, you can do a former reconstruction. Um, and uh, uh, the, question, the thing that uh, about the RJ instability is also very important because um, the ECU, just like the uh, PQ, the pronator quadratus, are extrinsic stabilizers of the DRUJ. Therefore, a subluxation or a, a disruption of the osteofibrous sheath of the ECU does uh, increase the risk of DRJ instability. Uh, and uh, um, as such, uh, it is important to treat this, this injury. 
in fact, uh, in, uh, in patients with a very, very mild BRJ instability who do not wish to undergo surgical treatment, and this is also another key point for our exam, you may want to mention that you can refer the patient to uh, the hand therapist for strengthening of the PQ and of the ECU as external extrinsic stabilizers of the Druge in the first instance to see whether you achieve uh, an improvement in stability and the decrease in the symptoms before considering surgical procedures. Question number two, Palmer type two TFCC tears. Type two tears are the degenerative tears. Uh, and they are indeed associated with chondral changes, either on the ulna head or uh, on the other side uh, of the TFCC, on the carpal bones. Um, they require mostly debridement, they don't require repair. Um, it's not true that they do not usually require any treatment because they can be painful. So uh, debridement, injection of steroids can be, can be uh, considered. However, uh, it, they do not require significant treatment. So this, this one is partially correct. Uh, they are not caused by trauma because they are degenerative and they are uh, not typically radial sided. Question number three is about piezotraquitral ganglia. Uh, they are not often obvious on clinical examination, unfortunately. It would be nice if they were. Uh, some of them are relatively big, so you may be able to see them. However, they are mostly ganglia arising from the FCU rather than the equitable joints that you see superficially. Uh, they cannot be easily appreciated on palpation. What you do when you perform palpation there uh, is to try to elicit the pain of the equitable joint. So what you do is to apply pressure on the pisiform bone uh, and test whether there are uh, symptoms uh, caused by the equitable arthritic changes and effusion, like you would do for the, for the patella when you examine the knee. Um, it may cause an nerve uh, compression, as, you, as we uh, clearly stated during the presentation. It does, uh, not always, of course. It depends on the size and location of the ganglion, but it does cause a risk of compressing the ulnar nerve. Uh, and they are usually associated with degenerative changes. So um, uh, the last one is also incorrect uh, because they are often associated with changes. That's the reason why the ganglia uh, arise. Although changes may be very mild. Okay, that's great, <clears throat> everyone. Thank you very much. I think Joe's just got one more question that popped up, and then we'll stop recording and start the vivers. Joe. Oh, hello, Mr. Gaiani again. So, uh, uh, in in your practice, what are the indications to fix the ulnar styloid in distal radius fractures? Mm -hmm. Is it the uh, uh, every unstable distal radial ulnar joint, or there is other indications? So that's uh, also a very interesting question because um, I mentioned, but perhaps uh, because of the length of this uh, uh, of this uh, presentation, it's uh, it may be missed. Uh, that it also depends on the patient's conditions, really. Uh, so it really depends on a number of factors. Clearly, if you have a young patient uh, with high functional demands, uh, uh, who has a grossly unstable DRUJ caused by TFCC avulsion with bony uh, with styloid avulsion, and you are fixing the radius, and you realize after fixation that DRUJ is unstable, then there is an indication for fixing it. And I would fix 100% of those ones. However, if you have a, a patient uh, who uh, is a low functional demand, has arth some arthritic changes of the distal radial nerve joint, or a very severely disrupted sigmoid notch, as it may occur in very high energy uh, injuries with, uh, uh, with a severe uh, uh, medial column disruption of the radius, then I would uh, consider probably not stabilizing it intraoperatively. I would prefer to treat the radius um, do the rehabilitation for the patient and see whether uh, symptoms are present later on that may need my attention. Because the risk is if you stabilize the druge in an arthritic joint or in a severely disrupted sigmoid notch situation, then you may cause pain yourself by means of stabilizing the druge. So you need to be quite careful with that. Thank you. Uh, what are the indications for arthroscopy and unresided pain? And is there a portal proximal to three, four portal and using for what? 
the proximal to the three four portal there is unfortunately no portal because there is the radius so you don't really want to yeah. to enter the radius with the scope uh, uh, there is the port they showed the proximal most ones are the distal radio ulnar joint portal uh, and the proximal foveal portal of the ulna which is underneath the tfcc because you look at the dist uh, as the deep attachment the main one of the tfcc so those are the proximal most but as i said they're very difficult ones and they're quite dangerous because if you don't look, place the instruments perfectly in the space you want to assess, you may cause chondral damage uh, or a damage to the deep attachment of the TFCC yourselves. So you need to be extremely, extremely careful. Uh, in terms of indication for arthroscopy, arthroscopy is indicated look for within arthroscopy clearly. Uh, it's, it's because you're suspecting a TFCC tear, or you want to assess the extent of damage caused by onocarpal abutment, uh, or you want to assess the lunotracuitral uh, ligament stability, or the mid-carpal portion, uh, including the capitate head. Uh, talking about ulnar sided risk pain, there are of course also radial sided indications for arthroscopy, for scaphalunate uh, 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 no uh, uh, ligament injuries, uh, scaphoid non union snack and slack wrist staging and so on so there are a number i also perform arthroscopy in terms of indication to fix particularly comminuted distal radial fractures including the uh, affecting the articular surface so you can perform uh, arthroscopically assisted distal radius fixation thank you very much That's uh, no, i just have one little thing to add uh, when talking about the adult ulnar styloid um, i just want to make it a uh, uh, a clear point for everyone uh, that uh, the style of version uh, that causes instability is only the one that includes the proximal portion of the styloid, uh, so the fovea, because the entire TFCC is attached to the styloid in that case, which is evolved from the ulna. Uh, but if the proximal attachment of the TFCC, which is the foveal attachment, is still attached to the ulna and you only have a tip of the ulna styloid evolution, that doesn't mean that you need to fix it because uh, uh, in that case I would I would not fix it I would see whether the patient is symptomatic later on and then address the problem of the distal component of the TFCC later on. Thank you very much. That's great thank you very much um, sorry I forgot the bit that um, we're going to move on to top tips for the FRCS mm -hmm. and case-based discussion with Mr Gagliani. Yes, thank I you. Show, I show um, a couple of cases So, just as a reminder of uh, the Oroch revision books, here we are. Uh, we have a case, we may be presented with a case uh, of uh, high energy injury uh, to the wrist. This is a case of a uh, right hand dominant, uh, young and healthy. Uh, patient, uh, semi professional horse rider that fell uh, off the uh, horse seven months before seeing you in clinic and was treated elsewhere. So uh, you see this patient seven months later with a, a, a wrist fracture already treated elsewhere uh, in a cast. Uh, and she comes to see you because of right wrist uh, pain, clearly ulnar sided because it's the topic of tonight's uh, uh, discussion and weakness. First of all, key points when you're asked something about ulnar sided wrist pain after high energy trauma, uh, you need to consider any potential previous injuries, also before the injury that is reported to you, you need to ensure that you are assessing whether the patient has comorbidities because you are suspecting that there is something relating to the trauma that may need uh, surgical treatment. Therefore, you want also to know whether the patient is a smoker or not, uh, because that may affect the prognosis of what you perform. You need to consider the type of trauma, in this case, high energy. So remember always to, uh, to perform a thorough um, clinical history uh, uh, collection when you do uh, this um, these, uh, uh, type of assessment. The timing and the type of treatment received, the patient was treated elsewhere in a cast, but when? Was it just after the injury? Was it two months later? Was it a timely treatment? Was the fracture reduced? Uh, was the cast a full cast or just a back slab? Was it above elbow or, be or below elbow? May have these caused any other stiffness issues that you are not aware of? So you need to be able to gather all this information uh, when you see the patient. This is very relevant to your uh, um, FRCS or exam. You need to demonstrate that not only you have the knowledge, but you have the capacity to apply to apply it in clinical settings. So you need to know not only what you're talking about, but also why you're talking about what you're saying. Uh, 
So it's very important to start from, from the beginning. So talk about uh, patient assessment, clinical history, and then clinical examination. What symptoms uh, in this case? Okay, we know it's ulnar of wrist pain, but what tests would you consider? Would you consider a DRUJ uh, stability test? Definitely yes, after a distal radius fracture or a wrist fracture in general, because you don't know whether the TFCC has been disrupted. You don't even know if the ulnar thyroid has been avulsed or not. Uh, you need to check if there is a deformity of the wrist. You may see it or you may not see it. If there is any swelling, ECU inflammation after the trauma, subluxation caused by disruption of the osteofibrous tunnel, you need to assess that as well. Uh, you need to assess the range of motion. Was uh, physiotherapy uh, carried out after casting? What is the current range of motion? Is there a mechanical limitation? Is there pain associated with motion? And the stability of all the key players, not only on the other side, but also on the, on the radial side. So I put also the scaphalunate ligament there. Never forget to mention the scaphalunate ligament. It's uh, uh, one of the most relevant, important ligaments we have uh, in our wrist. Uh, Lunotriquitral kidney, because we are talking about ulnar side of wrist pain, mid-carpal joint stability, and distal radial nerve joint. The patient, uh, undergoes investigations, you get an X-ray, and the X-ray shows a healed distal radius fracture, but it shows a avulsed ulnar styloid. Um, so you can then decide what you want to do. You want a CT scan to assess if there is union. You want an MRI scan, like in this case, to assess uh, the TFCC and not just the ulnar styloid. And the MRI scan here is very instructional in this case because it shows clearly what I was explaining a few minutes ago, which is that uh, when the ulnar styloid is completely averse, like in this case, including its base, which is that thin lip of bone you see um, radial to the ulnar styloid, uh, clearly you can see on, on the MRI scan that the whole of the TFCC has come off with the ulnar styloid. So you see there is a TFCC and the ulnar styloid is attached to it. So there is nothing left on the ulna in terms of TFCC attachments. It is a complete avulsion of the TFCC that clearly causes an instability. So this patient is coming to you complaining of pain on the ulnar side of the wrist and of uh, weakness. Remember that instability of the DRUJ um, can be a reason for the weakness, but can also be a consequence of um, the uh, lack of supportive musculature. What about the ECU? Is the ECU strong enough to help and try and stabilize this grossly unstable bruge? What about the PQ muscle? So that's the reason why you need to have asked the patient about physiotherapy. You need to check also the muscular mass of the forearm in the patient and compare it with the other limb. So it's all connected. Remember, it's not just the wrist you're assessing. You're assessing a person with an injury and you're assessing the patient as a whole, not just an X-ray or an MRI scan image. So extremely important to do everything appropriately and show um, confidence in your uh, clinical examination and not just uh, in your knowledge. Um, in this case, of course, now you know that there is a gross instability. You know that the uh, ulnar styloid is non-united. There is nothing really visible here in terms of bridging, not even fibrous bridging. You don't see any, any changes in signal. So it's completely non-united. So you need to consider uh, other things. So we already discussed about how to test the stability in ulnar deviation, neutral, and radial deviation of the wrist by means of either moving the ulna or the radius, if you prefer, which makes more sense, to test the stability. To compare it with the contralateral wrist, to assess the muscular masses of the forearm, in particular the extremity stabilizers, ECU and PQ, if they are working and uh, if they can be improved. So you should refer this patient for uh, hand therapy if the muscular masses are very, very small uh, or wasted. Classification of the injuries, you need to mention the classification, mention the pulmonary classification, and also mention the at the US uh, uh, treatment oriented classification because that also is very relevant in terms uh, of uh, decision making for these type of injuries. This one is a, a type 1B injury, so the commonest injury you have, which means it's a complete evolution. Uh, is an ulnar version of the TFCC, in this case, complete, of course. So, uh, what do you do for it? Clearly, in a young patient, you need to fix it, to reattach it if you want to restore stability. So you need to check the options you have. Uh, if you are asked about non-operative options, again, remember to mention the extrinsic stabilizers, the muscles, 
remember to mention splinting, remember to mention that this patient could have been treated, but you don't know what happened because you didn't see the patient beforehand, could have been treated with um, a sugar tongue splint for six weeks after the injury in order to try and achieve uh, healing of the ulnar styloid. Remember, it takes a long time for the uh, styloid uh, fractures uh, and the versions healing to occur, but it may occur especially in young patients. And uh, uh, it may take even several months sometimes to see some bridging, either fibrous or bony, across the non-union site in these cases. It's not uncommon to see that. Certainly, it's not happening all times. So that's also another problem you need to be very aware of and discuss with the patient. So again, you have a full range of options there. You need to, to have a in front of you, when you talk to the examiner, uh, the patient, so pretend the patient is there with you, it's not just an image, and think about the conversation you would have with the patient, about non-operative, operative, timing of your treatment, if you want to try with muscular strengthening first, and uh, splinting again is perfectly reasonable, however, in a non-union setting like this one, it may not work, it's likely it would not work, so you would ask them to consider surgical options, uh, however, again, you need to show that you are confident with all the options and you know uh, when they can be uh, performed. So this is extremely important. Should we move on with the uh, next case? Okay, uh, another case um, I would like to present to you uh, as uh, it is uh, something that may be asked to you during the uh, FRCS health exam. And again, it's not uh, the easiest uh, type of cases you may be asked about. Uh, uh, is this one. You have a 19-year-old patient coming to your, uh, to your clinic, is a manual worker, uh, otherwise healthy, uh, complaining of ulnar side of wrist pain, especially when riding a bike or using a drill or screwdrivers. Patient cannot recall any specific trauma, certainly nothing relevant to the wrist, and he complains of spontaneous onset of pain three years ago, but was never investigated. So the first time they come to the hospital for this problem. Remember, there is no trauma here. So again, take a good history, uh, especially in terms of past medical history, comorbidities that may have caused this pain onset, occupation. So, okay, it's a manual worker, so this may cause tendonitis, definitely. You need to think about uh, either FCU or ECU tenosynovitis. You can think about pisotraquitral ganglia or wear and tear, although the patient is just 19. Uh, so you need to think in terms of differential diagnosis. However, uh, you need also to consider that there are um, disorders that are not uh, just caused by the occupation of the patient, but they're caused by genetic factors. So you need also to take the family history in patients who do not report trauma and they start complaining of onset of pain. So consider really anything and everything because you don't have any imaging yet, you don't know anything about the patient, so you need to perform a thorough uh, history uh, and clinical examination. Symptoms-wise, patient complains of ulnar sided pain in the ulnocarpal region. You check if there is a deformity or some swelling and you check the range of motion. You also check, again, the stability of the key players in the wrist, scaphalonate, lunotraquitral ligaments, mid-carpal and distoradial nerve joint. If you can elicit any clunks or any inst instability uh, in comparison with the contralateral wrist. So, you examine this patient and you see that the ulna head is quite prominent in both wrists on the dorsum of the wrist, which is not that uncommon. Many people have prominent ulna, especially those with the positive ulnar variants. However, this patient is quite a prominent one. So you start thinking about it, and you, again, remember the family history I mentioned. You can ask the patient whether anyone else in the family has the same. And then you take an X-ray, and you see that there is a reason why uh, this is occurring. The ulna is definitely prominent. It's definitely dorsally prominent. Uh, however, remember, very rarely can be also primarily prominent underneath the carpus, but that's very rare. So I wouldn't expect the examiners to ask you this during the FRCS. It would be a very uh, difficult question. Uh, talking about the commonest pattern is this one I'm showing you today. You see the dorsally prominent ulna uh, head. And clearly you see that there is a radial anomaly. This case is a madelung uh, uh, deformity of the wrist. Uh, with the typical features uh, of the carpal bones shaped like a pyramid with the inverted apex uh, uh, on the lunate. You see the radial tilt completely subverted. Some of them have very significant radial bowing. In this case, you don't have much bowing, but however, uh, it is uh, still a madelung. Uh, 
and then you need to uh, start describing this type of um, deformity to the examiner extremely important to remember that there are also differential diagnoses. Madelung deformity, first of all, is usually bilateral. By definition, we define Madelung, the real, the true Madelung deformity, a bilateral one, uh, because it's congenital. Uh, and it's often uh, determined by genetic anomalies. However, it can also be syndromic or idiopathic. But the true Madelung is 99% of cases bilateral. We define pseudomadelungs, those that are unilateral, as a consequence of trauma or infection in childhood that has led to a growth arrest of the radius uh, and uh, uh, an anomalous shape. So those are pseudomadelung deformities, not the true madelung deformity. Uh, so you need to explain this to the examiner. Unilateral or bilateral? You need to check maybe the, the other wrist as well, take an X-ray and see uh, whether it looks the same. In that case, it would be a madelung, like in this case and you consider further investigations. What you want to see uh, to confirm the Madelung deformity is also the Dicker's ligament, which is an anomalous radiocarpal ligament uh, that uh, is present in the patients with Madelung deformity on the volar side of the wrist, and uh, uh, that can be seen on an MRI scan. So again, remember that the contralateral wrist X-rays in this case shows similar deformity, so you call it Madelung. And remember the features of Madelung. There are some features that are typical of this deformity. Uh, there is a lot of literature on them. Um, I uh, uh, made a summary here of the, uh, the typical ones. Uh, also, the paper quoted uh, underneath is, is quite uh, interesting because uh, it explains uh, how to assess this quantitatively on, uh, on X-rays. Again, shortening and bowing of the radius, increased volar and ulnar tilt of the distal radius articular surface because of the lack of growth uh, uh, in length of the radius. The ulna continues to grow and dislocates dorsally due to the length discrepancy with the radius, and this causes ulnocarpal abutment, dorsally prominent ulna, and ulnocarpal wrist pain, which is the reason why the patient came to see you. A wide distal radial ulnar joint, there is in fact no distal radial ulnar joint, there is no sig boy notch. The carpal bones form an inverted pyramid with the proximal apex on the lunate, as you can see on the X-rays, and the carpus is usually proximally and volarly subluxed. There are several degrees of subluxation. Some of them are more than the others, more subluxed than the others. And remember the famous Vickers ligament, which is anomalous between the radius and the carpus that you can see on MRI. I've taken this uh, MRI image here to show you the ligament. It's a thick band of dark uh, tissue uh, from, um, arising from uh, the, the radius and attaching into the lunate in this case, although it could be attached to the tracheoequitrum as well. Remember that treatment depends on the age and on the symptoms uh, of the patient. You can treat them non-operatively. Surgical treatment is often not required, really, and you can treat them with occupational therapy, activity modification, use of, of modified tools that do not elicit the ulnocarpal pain, um, postural adaptations. I wouldn't really um, consider the role of the steroid injections here because the deformity is such that I doubt that the steroid injection would improve much unless you have a ECU tendonitis caused by the deformity. In that case, you may want to inject the ECU sheath, but not, not really the ulnocarpal region is badly deformed. Or surgical treatment, and treatment depends on whether this is a child or an adult. Uh, in a child, you can release the ligament, you can perform uh, a physiolysis of the anomalous portion, the medial portion of the radius. Uh, so if they ask you, you need to be aware that when the child is young, you still have the potential to modify things by means of using the child's own growth uh, as the key factor. So what you do is to perform a physiolysis of the anomalous portion of the physis, which is the medial, so the ulnar side of the radius, uh, with interposition of fat or uh, soft tissue in order to prevent, again, that the physiolysis heals itself again. Uh, and then you can see uh, if over time this uh, leads to an improvement in the shape of the radius, length, and symptoms. Um, however, if the deformity is very severe, like the one I showed you, uh, even in a child, you may consider a radial osteotomy uh, when the child is old enough because you need to bear in mind that the radial osteotomy may damage the growth plate. And in that case, you end up with this more significant problem. So I would use this in older children or early adolescents. And again, you can release the Vickers ligament because it's a fibrous 
band uh, of tissue that you will find when you approach the radius uh, volarly for the osteotomy. Uh, in order to, to shorten the ulna without shortening it, you can again use the growth potential of the ulna um, for your perusal, really, and you can perform an ulnar epiphysiodesis. You just uh, have to use a K-wire or a little drill bit to, um, to uh, damage the growth plate of the ulna uh, and then let it, let it fuse. So uh, you basically cause a growth arrest of the distal ulna. However, don't do it too soon. There is no rule about the age. Um, this I've discussed extensively with a number of colleagues uh, from around the world and also uh, reviewed the literature on this topic. And there is uh, really no one who can say exactly the age where they were when they would do this, but they would all do it towards the end of the childhood and early adolescence. Because what you want to avoid also is to create a, a, a another link, this, uh, length discrepancy yourself by means of shortening the ulna uh, too soon in life. So again, uh, epiphysial disease is something you consider towards uh, later ages. Uh, and uh, when uh, you are seeing an adult with these problems, again, you can consider a radial osteotomy uh, in order to increase uh, the tilt of the radius and make it more anatomical and also the length. And you can consider an ulnar shortening. And this is a case in which you can really do either of them or both of them as required. Thank you very much.